welcome to my channel. Today we're going to do a special presentation on making a jewel setting. So I've prepared a slide pack for this and I'm just going to go through the slide pack and have that discussion. Not sure how long this will take, but please pay attention and watch. So my first slide is what we're going to cover. So why would you make a jewel setting? What references are available to help you in making this jewel setting? What are the tools that are needed in making a jewel setting? And the step-by-step -step techniques in actually making the jewel setting with a bit of a summary at the end. All right, why would you want to make a jewel setting? Because you're bored? Because you got nothing to do on the weekend? Because you want to try something that you think no one else can do? Or because you've got a watch that's got a jewel setting that has got a rubbed in jewel and you you cannot rub in a new jewel. There's no way. So you have to make the setting because a jewel that was taken out destroyed the rubbed in area of the setting. So the first thing is that jewel settings are really hard to find. I've been buying them off of eBay for years and they're still very difficult to get a hold of. You just can't pick up a jewel setting that you need. The, the size, the depth, um, the shape of the jewel setting, they're all different, right? So so the size of the setting matters and the size of the jewel that you're going to place in that setting matters. And if you have a setting, um, it might not fit the jewel and it might not be the right size setting for the plate. So it's got to be absolutely to spec to fit in that, in that plate properly and for the depth thing to be proper for that jewel setting. So that's a reason you might want to uh, make a jewel setting. The depth of the setting is very difficult to uh, to assess. There are tools used to actually measure the depth of the setting, but your first bet is to measure the old setting first, even if the jewel is cracked, so you know the depth of that setting. So when you put a new setting in, you can match that. So the other thing is matching the style of the setting. So this watch here had raised jewel settings. I believe there are nine karat gold settings, and it's really difficult to to match the exact gold setting. It's hard to get a nine karat gold rod, first of all, to uh, <clears throat> to put in your lathe and work the material. So you can use uh, brass to make that setting, So, which is what I've done, um, or copper. So copper also looks pretty good, but you've got to, you've got to be able to match it um, perfectly to the previous uh, jewel setting. So, so buying a parts movement so you can buy a parts movement the exact same caliber of this the watch that you're making the jewel setting and um, and buying that movement might solve your problem um, but then you're paying a lot of money to buy a parts movement so why not make the, sh the setting and the last reason for making a jewel setting that i can think of is that it's a lot of fun it's a challenge uh, not a lot of people can make jewel settings so uh, if you're able to succeed at this, then you've done something that a lot, not a lot of people can do. So that's a, the challenge of it alone is why well, usually I do things. So there are a number of references that are available for making a uh, jewel setting. Uh, page 150, Bench Practices for Watch Repairers by H.B. Fried. So this is an amazing book. It's not a general generalist book for watch repair. It's a, spe it's a specific expert master book for watch repair. If you, if you manage to get a hold of one of these books and you start reading it, you'll realize that it goes way beyond your simple repair or diagnostics of a watch. So that book on page 150 addresses how to make a jewel setting. The uh, Practical Watch Repair by DeCarl is also an excellent book. And it also addresses making a jewel setting not as detailed as bench practices for watch repair but still addresses it so you can get some tips out of that. If again you're lucky enough to have the Chicago School of Watchmaking book, which I actually have, there's a whole section, Lesson 30, in that book is actually how to make a jewel setting. So you need to get a hold of that book even if it's not uh, an actual uh, book, paper book, and it's the PDF files and get a hold of it. And you can get, just Google for it, and you can get the separate uh, lessons in PDF files for that specific book book all right now for the fun so what tools do you need to make a jewel setting tools 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 you have to have a watchmaker's lathe I've got a picture of one up there but there's all different types of watchmakers lathes there's Bowley lathes there's a uh, peerless lathes peerless lathes are pretty popular because they made them 
after the war in World War I, I believe, to train soldiers on how to become watchmakers. So you need a lathe, a good lathe, with a set of collets, um, and then you need gravers to make that jewel setting. So I've got gravers that are carbide gravers, and they're two and four millimeters wide and, and, f and f flat, and two and four millimeters wide and round, curved. Um, you need to have both those type of uh, gravers to be able to shape the jewel setting. So you need gravers for the jewel setting. And then you need a brass stock rod. So here you've got a picture of a brass rod there that's the right size. You want a rod slightly bigger than the jewel setting you're going to make so you can shave it down to the right size. Um, and you can find brass rod stock uh, on Amazon.com or, or, or your local uh, supplier hardware store. Then a measuring gauge is really handy as you cut material away. I use the Duzième gauge, that's French for 12. And there's a picture of that gauge on the bottom left hand side there of, of that group of pictures. Uh, really easy to use that gauge to get it down to size prior to fitting it into the plate. So use that. You need eye magnification. I didn't have to put anything in here, but you need a good set of, uh, you need a good eyepiece to be able to get in nice and close when you're making a jewel setting. I actually use a Chinese eyepiece. I'm going to just reach over here for a second, which is probably not a professional thing to do, but I got this from China. And this, this eyepiece here, I took one out and left the other one in, and it costs like 10 bucks online. And then you unscrew the top here, and you can get to, to times 25 on these lens. I think I use times 20. And I use this actually for doing balance staffs, and it's great for making a jewel setting. There's also a light in here, but I've never used a light. It's not, it's not useful. So you need a good eye magnification to do that, and, and it's got to be pretty close. So... You need Rodico, because Rodico is man's best friend, as we all know. Uh, maybe woman's best friend, too. I'm not sure. Um, but there's a picture of Rodico in that group of pictures in the bottom right. It's a Bergeron Rodico stick. Some pegwood is needed, and you'll see why later. A, one piece of pegwood is needed. You need a full box of patience. So, because as you do this, you're probably going to lose your patience a few times, and then you have to gain your patience back. Another note on that is as you're going into some very detailed work on watchmaking you get super frustrated just step back walk out of your watchmaking office whatever wherever you're making doing your work take a breath do something else and then come back and start again so once you get angry and frustrated your hands and your body react to your mind and you won't be able to do the detailed work that's needed if you if you don't have patience and you're not enjoying yourself I'm going to go through this super quick because there's detail later. So here's how you make the jewel set setting. I think there's 21 steps, something like that. So you drill a long hole in your stock metal. You fit and cut the jewel seat. You fit the jewel type, diameter, depth. You cut the burnishing rim. You insert the jewel. You burnish the rim and flatten. You cut away the leftovers. Um, you size the setting with the plate. You mark the setting for cutoff. You cut off the setting and place it in the jewel, ch jewel chuck. Then you install the jewel chuck in the lathe. You place the setting in the chuck. You measure the diameter and height of the old jewel setting top above the plate. You cut the setting to the correct top height. You cut the setting to the correct top diameter. You determine the top funnel style, style and size. You cut the top opening and work the funnel angle exposing the jewel. So you don't want to cut through there to completely expose the jewel, just the center part. You smooth, burnish, polish the funnel so it looks like the other jewels. You install the setting in the plate, in the plate from the top. You cut the shoulder that allows you to put the screw in and cut in the screw. You test it and you adjust it and you're done. That was easy. So <laughs> making a jewel setting should only take two minutes. So the first thing you do is you drill a hole and then you grave the jewel seat. This is where the jewel sits. So as it says on the slide, you drill a long hole smaller than the jewel diameter. Then you grave the jewel seat with the right diameter and depth to hold the selected jewel. Then you take pegwood and you carve it down to the size of the jewel hole. Then you install the jewel into the pegwood or onto the pegwood and then flatten the end of the pegwood to prevent the jewel from falling off. That's a pretty cool technique, by the way. You have to make sure you can just push the pegwood down on your table 
and the end part will mushroom and that'll keep the jewel on the pegwood. And now the jewel can be used to go back and forth as you trial fit, as you cut the hole, uh, that, that it becomes a seat for the jewel. And remember when you drill the smaller hole, drill it long, and that allows you to redo your work if you make a mistake in making the setting. So drill it down half an inch in, right? If you've got that much real estate in your, in your stock, drill it right in there. And if you screw up the first setting, you can, you can face it off with your graver and start again. So make sure it's a long enough hole that you're drilling. And remember that hole is not the size of the drill, uh, of the actual jewel, it's smaller than the jewel, so the jewel can seat in there and doesn't go all the way through the hole. So fit the jewel in the seat. So this is the fun part. So you need to basically take that jewel and you need to grave the hole where the jewel fits, right? Now that, that hole needs to be deep enough for the jewel to, to go in deep enough that you can burnish over that jewel and hold it in. And the burnishing material will grab the jewel on the base and hold that in place. If the jewel is not seated down low enough, then you can't burnish it in place. So, so if it's too high. If it's too low, then you have, you've got way too much burnishing material and it could cover the hole itself and it, or rip the burnishing material. So it's a bit of a trial and error activity to get the seat right, but you need to have it just deep enough to be able to have the burnishing material wrap around. This could be a trial and error activity for you when you're making when you're making your first jewel setting. Now you can also see in this picture that the the pegwood is sticking into the jewel. Well on the other side of that jewel hole is also pegwood and that pegwood is flattened on the other side so it has a mushroom head which keeps the jewel in place. That way you can keep doing trial and error as you carve away the hole for the jewel, right? So and, and as you're carving away the hole for the jewel, the hole you carve is not squared on the, on the sides. It's rounded on the sides to conform to the jewel because the jewel is usually flat then tapered. So you have to make sure you're accommodating that so the jewel sits flat in that hole. I usually take a tailstock with, with, a, with a, uh, some rod or something that, to push that jewel in to make sure it is flat with the tailstock. So you can use this, your staking set, put a stake into the tailstock with the right size, and then push down to make sure the jewel isn't rocking in that hole to prepare it from burnishing. That's very, very important. So this has to be the hardest task in making a jewel setting, and that's cutting that burnishing rim. So as you can see here, um, I've taken a rod, a very, very nice carbide, carbide rod, and I've used a 2000 and 3000 diamond plate to turn the tip of that rod into a needle. So that tip of that rod is super sharp and sharp enough to actually cut a trench in that material. So as it says, you cut a fine trench just on the outside of the whole rim and you're exposing material that's needed to burnish over the jewel. So this can be done manually or you can have a special tool installed in the tailstock. I have that tool, it's very difficult to find. And really it's a tool that has one rod going this way and another sharp one that comes out and you can adjust the depth or the distance between the tip of this rod and the center. So, and that allows you to be very specific when you are very deliberate and specific when you cut that rim. But I, the jewel settings I've made, I've used this technique you see down in that photo where I've been able to manually carve that trench. You just have to, to be very careful as you do it and do it slowly. So don't, you're cutting into material that doesn't need to go, doesn't need to spin fast in your lathe. It's, it's, it's hard to describe how fast it needs to spin, but just do a trial on it to see the, see the cutting, take a piece of material and use that tool to cut before you actually cut with your, you know, the final piece with your, uh, with your graver. So make sure the graver is super sharp and start digging the trench. So you dig the trench, Put the jewel in and have a look at what that trench kind of looks like with the jewel sitting in there because you haven't burnished it over the jewel yet but you can get a feel for how much rim there is on that to fold it over so it doesn't have to be much rim to fold it over but it does have to be enough to keep the jewel from moving so here's where you insert the jewel and burnish the rim so as it says here once the trench is cut to the right depth and the burnishing material is exposed Burnish the material over the jewel using a smooth angled burnisher. 
this tool can be made if you need it. So it's a little bit difficult to see what this burnisher looks like, but if you could imagine uh, one side is sort of a post like this, and then the other side is sort of, it's got a little rounded area like this, so that you're allowed, you can put the burnisher in, the post can rub on the outside of the rim, and the inside of the rim has that rounded area that you can take with your hand and push at an angle to push that material, which is burnishing it over the jewel. So if you're curious about how to make that tool or what they look like, send me an email, let me know. I'll, I'll put a picture up of that tool later on so you can see it. But really you need a tool that's flat on one side and has a little bit of roundness on the other side to, to push the material over. And you, you should put oil on that as well as you're, as you're doing that activity so that the burnished material doesn't, doesn't get hotter from friction and actually crack because it could crack and then unwrap itself and you'll see that pieces of the material just fly out. So oil it. I did not put that in the, in the description, but make sure you oil that. You can use sewing machine oil to do that, or you can use 0W20 synthetic oil. It doesn't really matter that much. Do not use cutting oil to do that because cutting oil would cause additional friction for that. So a nice burnisher. Um, I, should, I should have had a picture of the burnisher in there. I might add that to the slide deck. Um, so you can actually see what this burnisher looks like. Um, but again, it's flat on one side, so it's sit sticking in the trench. The flat side is facing outward, and the smooth side is facing inward to allow you to rotate your hand and actually push that material inward. So I hope that's a good enough description. Trial and error, folks. Trial and error. So now that you've successfully, and I'll say successfully, burnished the material over the jewel, and you can see that better in the picture on the right hand side. So you can see the materials wrapping over the jewel. Once you've done that, as you can see, there's leftover material on the outer rim of the of the uh, of that jewel setting. So you have to remove that material and you can remove it right up to the the, the base of the jewel or the burnishing material so that it's completely flat. And once you do that on the left hand side, there's a picture flattening that that edge plus the burnishing material. Once you've burnished it over the jewel as well, if you take a flat stake, you're able to actually push that burnishing material a bit more and make sure that jewel itself is flat in, in the seat because that's super important that you don't have you don't have a zero end, side shake. So you need to have a little bit of side shake when that pivot goes in there. And if the jewel is at an angle like this, it'll be touching the pivot on one side on the left and then the other side on the right. So it'll be touching it on diagonally across that across that setting. So make sure it's flat as I said here and remove the material, the extra material and make sure it's nice and flat. So here's the more trial and error as they say. So in the picture on the left hand side, here's where I'm removing the remaining material from the edge, right? The outer edge and to match the exact plane of the burnishing material that's been placed over the jewel, so it's all kind of flat. And then you can use the existing setting to determine the, the depth of the jewel within the plate, right? So you're taking the plate now and you're graving away material from that setting, from that edge part, right? Just enough material so that jewel setting actually fits in the plate. And if you can see in the picture on the right hand side, I'm fitting it in from the top. Okay, so I'm pushing that down from the top. And, and the depthing, if you have looked at the old jewel, the depthing should almost be parallel with the base of that plate. So have a look at the old jewel first and look at how that was set in so you don't have too much um, end shake on, your, on the uh, part. It's usually, usually the sec third wheel or the fourth wheel maybe that you're making this setting for. So you've got to cut away that material to make sure that that base fits into the hole in the plate. And again, it's a trial and error thing. If you cut away too much material here, then you have to start over again because the setting will be loose. So you want the setting to have a bit of friction to stay in that place and not be loose. So be very careful when you remove material, especially this material is soft. So it'll come off pretty fast and you'll be screwed and have to do another one. Now you can redo them until, you're, until midnight every day for a week if you keep screwing it up. So in this case, just be careful. And I know when you're doing this, I've had this thought myself, 
you're going ah, just a little bit more maybe just a little bit more that is a super dangerous thought every time you say just a little bit more there's a chance that you'll press a little bit hard on your graver and then the material goes away and there's no ma way of, of making that bigger so once you've done that you can't stretch that rod so that you're screwed so you just when you get that sense that it's, that it's good measure it take a little tiny bit off measure it again you can even use a, a burnishing file right to remove material if you're really afraid of removing too much material you can use a file I've, I've never had to but you can if you want so now that you've got the base of the of the setting set you want to cut away the actual right size of the setting the length of the setting I'll say so using the existing setting you can determine where to cut off the new setting right to ensure there's enough setting exposed for the top of the setting that is shown on the upper part of the watch plate you can take a little bit of extra off because you can grave it down but don't make it too short because you can't add material once you've taken it off so you can use the existing setting to mark it and what you're doing on a lathe to mark it is that you're using a piece of rotico I usually use my flip over tool rest I attach the rotico with the existing setting on the tool rest then I shape the rotico so that setting is very close to the rod that I'm going to be marking and then once I've done that I just take my graver by hand freehand and just touch that just touch that metal or the material with my graver and that'll make a line in the uh, the material and that's your cutoff point and when you're cutting off the material you cut off towards you towards the uh, the uh, chuck so you don't cut off away from it so otherwise because but you need that to stop at that line so you're cutting in the direction of the lathe I'll say or the direction of the chuck so be very careful when you cut it off but use the old part old part to measure it and, um, and if again if you screw that up you got to start all over again so now you've got to work on the top part of that jewel setting given that you've depth it right within the plate it's going down to the exact level you want it to go in the plate so you've graved it down so the jewel setting will be will have a rim on it that sits on that plate just a little bit because you've graved that the base or the bottom part of that setting to absolutely fit perfectly in the hole and left a little tiny ma material so the jewel setting just doesn't fall through so you've got that now and you've got jewel chucks jeweling chucks so you can see in this picture here I've got a set of jeweling chucks that you fit the jeweling chuck to the base part of that jewel setting um, and then then with the setting so you install the jewel chuck in the watchmaker's lathe you install the setting into the chuck and you expose the top part of the jewel setting to complete the graving of the actual jewel setting I think the next slide I talk about the actual graving but when you look at that you're looking at the 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 top part of that setting look at the old setting and look exactly what that setting looks like so now you've got to to style that setting uh, exactly the way the old one was now the hole you drilled from before will be the diameter of that smaller hole in that picture because you haven't graved inside that at all so it's the first hole you drilled that'll be that diameter if you look inside that hole you'll see part of that jewel setting just resting there on the other side which is perfect right so here's where the artwork comes in you have to shape the setting diameter and the height right so the shape is important you start with the shape and then you determine the height and then you do the height if you do the height first you may go too low and not be able to do the shape so you look at the height and the shape from the old the diameter and the height from the old setting right you have to face off the setting in the chuck to make sure it's the correct height right and then cut the diameter to spec of the old setting so it's you can face it off first like I said to the height but don't take it all off take take almost all of it off and then start shaping that setting and you're looking at making a funnel in the top if that's the type of setting it was the one I was working on here was a nine carat uh, nine carat gold raised setting right it was a gorgeous setting um, and I had to make it look exactly like the other settings not necessarily like the previous setting which it should look like but the other settings because you can you'll be able to see that one of the settings does not look like the other it's a sesame seat sesame street thing 
Now here you see I'm doing the what I call the funnel work. So you work the funnel angle. Here it was a bit of a, the angle was, was in fact a funnel. And you're working that angle. You can see the jewel on the other end. So you gotta be very, very conscious of that jewel that if that graver goes too deep, it'll rip through the material that's holding the jewel back. And then the jewel will just flip right up through the top. So you don't want to, you don't want that to happen. You eyeball the funnel. I don't know if there's any method of measuring that funnel other than eyeballing the funnel. And you make sure that the depth is correct and the angle of that funnel uh, matches the existing setting, right? And again, don't carve too deep. Take your time as you break through the material and you'll reveal the jewel on the other side and that material holds that jewel in place as the pivot pushes up, the shaft and pivot pushes up. So actually the pivot goes through the jewel and the shaft is what the bare part of the shaft is what uh, pushes up, so the flat part. So, so take your time, make it look exactly like the old setting, um, and then you're going you're gonna to do some really nice jewelry work. So here's where you need to draw upon your artistic side. So if you recall before, I talked about the burnisher that I used. The picture on the left is the burnisher that I used. And, and that within that picture on the left, I don't think I, I've got a pointer that I can show you, but the bottom part of that burnisher is the flat part, right? As I said before, the top part of the burnisher is the rounded part. And so that rounded part is what I use um, at an angle within that funnel to actually smoothen out the material. So it kind of smoothens it, it burnishes it, smoothens it, and it, uh, it moves the material onto the material. That's what burnishers, in fact, do. So this gives you the chance to make the inside of that of that jewel setting look really well. It's gold, Jerry, gold. <laughs> It'll look really good. Um, that was for Ed Horn and Sonny, uh, Sonny Morehouse as well. I had to do a gold in there, so. And, and Mr. Breeden as well. So, <clears throat> so, so take your time with that burnisher on the left and, and work that setting so it's burnished perfectly, right? It'll be shiny as heck when you're finished. It's in the it's in the jewel chuck right now. It's chucked up nicely, and and how much chucks does a jewel chuck have? When a jewel chuck could chuck jewels, well, that's pretty shitty. Anyway, so the diagram on the right hand side, I've taken a little a soft pad, right? So you can buy those anywhere. You can buy that as part of your part of your. Um, I think they're a Dremel tool pad would work. So, but you've got to carve that pad down to be the size of that jewel setting. It can't be really big, right? So that's what you do. So if you've got a, 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 ha a pad, I can't remember what they're called, but they're pads, um, and they're dense, and then you can file them down to be the size of the jewel setting, and you can use that to spin the, the jewel setting in the lathe. And again, you're spinning the lathe as well with the picture on the left when you're burnishing. So you're spinning the lathe slowly and you're using that to just clean up everything and make it and polish the whole thing. And it turns out you don't really need to use gold when you do such a great job with the, uh, with the brass. Now you have to install the setting into the plate. So that's pretty easy. You push the setting into the plate, right? But then you have the setting is where the screws go in. The setting is still round. So you need to countersink uh, to allow those screws in a lot of cases to allow those screws to go down and countersink to create a table in the setting. So the setting, the screw goes down and the head of the screw sits on a table that's the actual setting itself, right? And it's not a lot of material. And this is a countersinking tool on the left that you have to buy to this cutter to actually do that. So the base of that cutter, as you can see, it looks like a small pivot that is the size of the screw, the hole in the plate where the screw goes in, the screw hole basically. And, and it's rubbing against the threads on the inside, but not, not so, in a, so hard that it's going to ruin the threads. And that little jaw, the three cutter jaw you see moving up from that pivot actually cuts the material away on the edge of the setting. So you've got kind of, and it can't be bigger than the hole that's in the plate, the countersink and the hole in the plate. It's got to be the same size. That way, when you lower that, you're turning it, and it's and it's actually removing material from the from that part of the setting, kind of making a little bit of a half moon, and it's moving it, and you're, it's lowering it down to the point where it's level with the 
depth of the seat for the screw head and then there's still a little bit of material left obviously on the bottom of that setting to hold that in place and that's the seat this setting table I call it so that's a tricky job I think there's I don't know if there's any reference material that you can find to how to do that other than buying a set of cutters which is which not easy to get and then and just doing that job so that's how you do that um, if you don't have cutters you're going to actually file the jewel setting itself with a round rounded file to the shape of that screw hole and, and that's the outer diameter of that screw hole in order to be able to create the seat for that setting very difficult you need to have those cutters so go on onto eBay and search and search use the word cutter and watchmaker and eventually you'll find something now that you've got the job done just place the setting in and screw it down now you can see in the picture on the right hand side um, that's the old setting I have in my tweezers and then the new setting is the one without the screws in it but the new setting is the one sitting there so I believe this was Ed Horan's watch that I worked on and Ed you can confirm that in the comments maybe but I think it was your watch Ed and you can see how close that setting looks to the existing settings on the uh, the existing two settings and at, from a distance from a not a not a very far distance but maybe 12 inches 6 to 12 inches you can't tell the difference you cannot tell the difference between those settings you wouldn't know and over on the left hand side you can see the two settings the upper picture on the left shows the old setting with the jewel out the one beside it is the new setting right with the new jewel in and below you can see the two settings there are almost equal right and when they're installed in the watch you can't tell the difference so that's it so that's the uh, how to make a setting there's my ugly mug there um, again uh, I fix watches for people uh, mainly pocket watches but I do do watches occasionally for people that really try to break my heart with a story right so I did a Rolex a couple of years ago for a lady that whose father's father's Rolex or something and I said yeah okay I'll do it so very nerve-wracking for me for working on a Rolex but I do pocket watches mainly and you can see in the background some of the books I have I have a lot of books on how to do watch repair if you're going to get into this hobby at all and you're going to be proficient at it you have to study I think a chat I had with Sonny Morehouse last night uh, he said study study read 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 so and he was so right you need to have these books you need to read them you need to learn you need to do practice you need to do trial 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 do practice 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 and then when you think you've got it open the book up read again try again there's never an end to the trial and practice you need to actually become a decent watchmaker so so that was a quick video on how to make a jewel setting i hope you enjoyed the uh, chat on this and please like and please share it um, i'm hoping this gets around and i'll be presenting this in person in ottawa at the ottawa clock and watch makers or watch collectors society meeting on the 4th of february uh, this year and we'll see how many tomatoes i can collect <laughs> somebody a guitar player said steve morris a guitar player said he always sits just far enough so the tomatoes can't reach him <laughs> which i thought was funny as heck so anyway thanks again for supporting my channel and thanks for watching and lots of comments please if you like the video let me know um, if you want more like this or more educational like this uh, i perhaps could do this as well so just let me know and thanks again and stay safe and have a good day